Well, we have a depleted uh, class time. Uh, people are getting tired. <laughs> Pardon me? Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> no, I think the test was easy. I had to make the final really hard. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so now we understand how to talk to the computer from peripheral devices, right? So. Uh, there are two peripheral devices that are very important from the point of view of uh, uh, what you get done uh, on an everyday basis. Of course, keyboard, mouse, and all these kinds of things are important, but you know, your disk is the one uh, that stores uh, your persistent data, files, you know, important movie files that you want to watch and so on. Um, and, uh, and then the network is how you get to the internet and uh, download your favorite uh, video or see the YouTube video that you want to see, uh, all these kinds of things, right? So these are two important uh, uh, subsystems that uh, we're going to focus on uh, for the rest of the uh, semester. And, and, um, and, and, and I, you know, I could do that in either order, uh, talk about disk first or the network uh, first. And I choose to do network first simply because you have project that is based on, on that. So we'll do that first and then we'll come back to, uh, um, uh, to the disk. And, um, the, uh, uh, and, and when I talk about, uh, when I talk about the, uh, uh, the network subsystem or the disk subsystem, uh, I mean both the software and the hardware, right? Like always we've been doing. And, and uh, so, uh, uh, so when, when we talk about, I mean network is very exciting uh, 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 personally because, uh, you know, I had the most fun when I wrote the book, writing the networking chapter, because that's an area that I don't do research in. <laughs> uh, and, and so that was a, a place that I learned a lot myself as I was writing the book. And, um, uh, and, and it was also, uh, you know, uh, uh, very cool from the point of view of making uh, interesting things happen on your computer, right? And, uh, and the interesting thing that you'll find is that, you know, everything that you've learned up to now in terms of pipelining, processor pipelining and things like that, Networking becomes so easy to understand because you know understand how processor pipeline works, and network is all about uh, pipelining, as we'll see in a, in a bit. And um, uh, so, so let's start the discussion about networking by finding out what we know about networking. What is the internet? What does internet mean to you, Jen? He said yes. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> uh, what is the internet? No. <laughs> Connect, connecting computers, okay. Uh, anything more? Vladimir? What, what does internet mean to you? A, a, a whole bunch of? Into the computer. Into many computers, okay. Anything else, uh, Ryan? Well, you know, all of you have heard of the term internet, right? So it, mean, it must mean something to all of you, maybe different things to different people. I heard uh, computer, computers connected together. I don't know what Shane said. You said the same thing, Shashank? Uh, network of networks. Network of networks. So what does that mean? So let's uh, take a, an example. Uh, Peter, do you have friends outside of Georgia Tech? Pardon me? <laughs> Hopefully, right? So do you send mail messages? Uh, pick uh, someone outside Georgia Tech that you send mail to, somewhere out, distant. Any? Uh, where, where, where does he live? Pardon me? Oregon. Okay. So you send your message from your dorm room, let's say, an email. What happens? Your computer, from your computer, you send a message out, right? That's all you know. Then what happens after that? Uh, Matt? What is the server? What, what server? Another computer. So who, who what, what is a computer? Who owns a computer? Now, what, what kind of connection, what kind of uh, access do you have from your dorm room? You have access to your uh, uh, to your dorm network, right? Uh, do you live in the dorm? Okay, so you have a dorm network. 
right? And and uh, so that's you know when you say server, you're talk, talking to uh, uh, a server that is on the DOM network, and and that might go to where you know when you said network of networks, where where, where might it uh, go from the DOM network? A routing network within Georgia Tech, right? And then what? So, so from there it has to get to what is called an ISP, right? Internet service provider. We don't know what that is. You know what Georgia Tech may be connected to in terms of internet service provider. Um, and for instance, if you have a home network, um, you might be talking to a, um, a service provider like Comcast or uh, a, a Dish Network or you know um, uh, Bell South. Uh, all of these are different ways of getting your bits out of your machine into a service provider that you trust will get your message to John, <laughs> right? And uh, so you give it to the ISP, uh, let's say Comcast. Um, uh, but your friend John may have a dial-up modem, <laughs> right? It may, may not be, but it's possible that uh, all he has is, uh, is a dial-up modem that connects to the telephone. And, and uh, so how does Comcast finally deliver stuff to John? Uh, maybe. So we, we, le we left uh, uh, Peter's computer, got into the uh, got into the dorm network, got into some ISP, maybe Comcast. Okay, then what happens? Okay, and so basically that that forwarding par part is where this network of network comes in, right? So you have a whole bunch of networks. Each is a separate network. So Comcast is a network. Dom uh, 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 is a network. And, and then, you know, uh, it gets out to other ISPs along the way um, uh, um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and finally gets to Oregon and finally gets, well, you know, is, is, so th this person that uh, Peter wants to send this message to um, uh, could be another student in, uh, uh, in, in OGI. Uh, who knows, right? So, uh, so then it goes to the campus network of that um, um, uh, institution and then to the dorm network of that institution, and then finally gets to the computer that, uh, that, that John is connected to, right? So you see that there's a whole bunch of networks. I mean, so how does mail transfer? You know, uh, I'm not talking about US, uh, I'm not talking about email. You know how uh, physical mail goes, uh, Drew? You know, suppose you, uh, you send picture postcards to your mom, mother's just coming up. You do? Okay, so what happens? How does it, how does it go? Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. By plane, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so, so what, what Drew explained is uh, uh, how physical mail travels, right? So you 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 uh, put it in your post box, and then and then from the post box. A uh, mail carrier picks it up, takes it to the local post office, and and sorts it. Right? Uh, what Nate was saying about you know finding out where it has to be sent, and then it it sends it uh, to a, uh, a distribution center probably for Atlanta, and then it you know if it is going out of town, then it may actually uh, uh, be put on a plane, and and uh, sent over to the destination, and then the reverse process happens. Right? Isn't that very similar to what happens to your email? Right? It's exactly the same thing, right? So it's exactly the same thing that happens to uh, your email, uh, what happens to your physical mail, right? So it is the same uh, sort of uh, uh, distribution. And you think, think about it, uh, you know, uh, Drew said that uh, if it has to go from, say, Atlanta to uh, some other destination, the physical mail, you put it on a plane, right? What is the equivalent of that in, uh, uh, in the Internet world? Big pipe, right? <laughs> Big pipe because you know the the, the, the connection that uh, that Peter has from his computer to the DOM network. I don't know. Uh, is it a gigabit network? Uh, maybe right. Uh, uh, or maybe it's a megabit, hundred megabit. Uh, uh, um, uh, or if you have a wireless, probably it is uh, ten megabits per second. Right. So it's a it's fairly thin in terms of the pipe that connects your computer to the network. Okay. But from the net from once it leaves your computer as it goes through the uh, through the networks 
uh, you, you need fatter and fatter pipes. Why is that? No data is coming in. Zero is not the only one, <laughs> right? Lots of people are sending lots of stuff. And not only uh, uh, real people, but there are uh, botnets selling uh, spurious spam messages. <laughs> so there is huge bunch of traffic that's going out. And, and so you really need a thick pipe. And, and that's similar to the airplanes, right? That you have a you know, big thick pipe that carries all the data. Um, and, um, uh, and, 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 you know, and distributes it. And this is all that is happening in, when you think about the, um, uh, the internet. And, and, you know, this picture that I have here, uh, essentially, uh, you all answer what that is. So this is exactly what Drew was saying as to how uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the postal system works. And, and it might be that, you know, in order to get to the final destination, you might even have to use a bullet card to get to the, uh, to the final destination, depending on where you're sending it in the world, right? And, uh, and electronic mail is not uh, dissimilar. Uh, that's exactly the same thing that's happening. That's what Shashank was saying, that you have different networks that connect the source to destination. And uh, the access point, this is called the access network. You know, the dorm network that you have is the access network, where the end devices, like a computer is connected to, is the access network. And, um, and, and it could be, you know, provided by the phone uh, company. It could be provided by the cable company, and so on. And then you have regional ISPs that that carry the bits, and 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 this is the core of the network, okay. And this is where big thick pipes that AT and T owns, or um, you know, all these different uh, uh, telecom companies ho uh, own these pipes, uh, thick pipes that that these uh, regional ISPs connect to in order to send their bits, and and finally it gets to the destination. Okay, so this is exactly the same thing as, uh, as how your physical mail works. And um, so w when you think about, uh, you know, the, um, uh, so far when we talked about the computer and, and the subsystems that is within your box, okay, everything was under your control, right? Or you thought it was, right? Uh, uh, you know, Microsoft controls it, but, you know, or, or uh, Mac controls it, but still it is your box, right? So the, uh, the operating system, the... Uh, uh, the pieces of the operating system that you've seen, the pieces of the hardware that you've seen, it's all within your control, okay? Now, when you are actually communicating with the rest of the world, uh, things uh, start becoming messier, right? Because now, um, when, you, when, you're, when you're sending a, a message from here to here, uh, you know, what, you, what you're doing is you're using a, a physical network, and, and that is outside your uh, domain of control, and, uh, and lots of things can happen. And many of the things that can happen are bad things that can happen, right? And so let's start at the top here. So let's start, start with the message. So when you think about the message, um, you have to send this message and can be arbitrary in size, right? It could be, you know, a movie that you're sending or an email that you're sending uh, or pictures that you're sending. So the size of the message is something that is entirely deci decided by the application, right? And, uh, and but on the other hand, uh, what decides the size of messages that you actually send out on the wire? What decides that? Charles? Um, uh, go even further down. Finally, you know, you know, if you think about if you think about your uh, uh, box and the processor and the memory, what decides the uh, uh, the size of messages that can, that can go between processor and memory? The, the the hardware, right? The hardware specification. Similarly. In, in when it comes to the uh, uh, to those messages, ultimately it is a network interface card, right? That is going to say, well, I have I can only send so many bits at a time, right? And when we talk about bandwidth um, of, uh, uh, of 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 your connection, what do we mean by the bandwidth of a connection? What what do we mean when we say the bandwidth of a connection? It's micro, micro, right? Yeah. Over a given time, let's be more precise than, than that. So, uh, sorry again. Over time, that you can put out from your computer, right? So, bandwidth is, you know, how many bits can I put out out, out of my computer, right? And uh, but it doesn't say anything about how much time it's going to take to reach the destination, right? What is that decided by? What decides uh, how much time it's going to take to reach the destination? Okay, so the, uh, so you said the distance in some sense, right? So, so um, and and then is that the only thing? 
given the distance, what decides the time it's going to take? Right. So ultimately, see, uh, we talked about different uh, bandwidth of pipes, right? So you know, you may have a hundred megabit per second uh, connection from your um, computer to the uh, to the access network, and then down in the guts of the go to the network, uh, maybe it's a ten gig gigabits or hundred gigabits connection that is uh, is, is sending bits um, uh, through the network, right? And and so when you think about it, what you have to do is um, you know you, you uh, first of all, as as Michael said, there is a distance. Even if I let's forget about all these switches and all that, right? Forget about all that. If I say that uh, Shashank is wanting to communicate with Ron, and 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 I'm going to put a direct wire between these two things, um, and and he can put out bits at a rate that you said is decided by the network interface card. That's the bandwidth, right? And and uh, now, how much time is it going to take between these two guys? What is deciding that, Abhishek? No, 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 I'm not talking about any servers now. So I'm directly connecting wires, Ron. Physical distance and then? Speed. So the speed is ultimately governed by what? What is the ultimate speed that you can get? Speed of light, right? So ultimately, speed of light is the thing that is going to limit you, right? And, and clearly, we cannot reach the speed of light. It's going to be less than that based on whatever the technology that you're using, whether it is electronic switching or photonic switching and so on and so forth. And, but ultimately, as Michael pointed out, there are two things involved here. One is how quickly can I place bits on the wire from my end? That is the bandwidth that's available to me, right? Is that, is that clear? So the bandwidth is basically saying how quickly can I place bits on the wire, right? If I have a 100 megabit per second connection, I can place bits more quickly. If I have a gigabit per second uh, uh, connection, I can uh, uh, place the bits even more quickly, right? So that's telling me how quickly I can put uh, bits on the wire, but how much time it's going to take to go from source to destination, it is decided by the distance and, and uh, Michael said the number of switches and so on and so forth, yes, all of those come into play in, in deciding because if it is close by, we don't need any switches, right? As you, as you go farther apart is where you have lots of these switches and so distance is what is governing um, uh, 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 the latency for a message to go from source to destination and what decides the latency is the uh, uh, is, is, is the uh, is the transmission speed that you have, right? Ultimately, you're governed by speed of light considerations. Um, and uh, but in reality, on the internet, what uh, governs all these uh, um, uh, uh, you know the latency is just the fact that you have to traverse several different networks. And in each network, you are you are going through you know as Abhishek said, a server that is gathering the packets, forwarding it on. And, um, and there is some switching delay involved in that. And uh, that is, that's called switching delay. That is when you go from one network to another. So when I showed you this, uh, this picture here, that, uh, that you're going through a bunch of networks. So you, you, uh, you, place, the, uh, you, you place the bits on the wire uh, based on your um, access, you know, the, uh, the network interface card that you have. And then the access network, depending on the, uh, uh, the, the fatness of the pipe that it has, it can send the bits out um, in, in a certain amount of time. That is the transmission delay. Then it comes to this regional ISP, let's say, and at this point, you know, this guy, the, the server is going to have its own switching delay, right? In order to take that and then put it into inter its own internal pipe. And so even if there is no other traffic, let's think that Peter is sending to John and that is the only thing that's happening in the universe at this point of time, okay? In that case, what you have is the, um, uh, the time it takes to put the bits on the wire, and the time it takes to traverse this, uh, time it takes to switch here, uh, time it takes to traverse this, time it takes to switch here, and so on and so forth till it gets here. So all of this is a switching delay and the transmission delay, right? Is that, right? Is that idea clear? Okay. That's what is involved in a single transmission. Now, unfortunately, Peter is not the only one, right? Everybody is using the network. Everybody is sending messages. And, and what can happen is, you know, from the dorm, several people are sending messages. And, and, uh, and, and then there is a, another kind of delay that comes about. And what is that kind of delay? Do you know? Any idea? There's lots of people who want to send messages and there's a single server that has to field those messages and, and, and send them towards the destination. You get another kind of delay. Uh, pardon me? 
queuing delay, right? Because packets accumulate, and now you have to queue those things one after the other, and you send that on, right? So there is the um, uh, the, the the delay associated with uh, with sending a message from source to destination is first the uh, the bandwidth governs as uh, how quickly you can put the uh, the bits on the wire, and then there is uh, and that is uh, the what is called the source overhead. We'll talk about some of these components of the delays more carefully uh, later on, but I just want to give you an intuition in the beginning that there is this um, uh, delay associated with uh, just the sender overhead of placing the bits on the wire, right? And and there is a combination there. There is not just the speed of the uh, the interconnect, but it is also the software overhead, that's the thing that we're going to talk, talk about uh, uh, immediately. There's a software overhead in placing bits on the wire, and how quickly you can place bits on the wire is decided by the, the bandwidth of the interface that you, that you have, okay? And, and once you place the bits on the wire, then it's going to traverse, and, and traversal is decided by how fat the pipe is, what is the queuing delay at the server in order to use that, uh, that pipe, and then all the accumulated queuing delays as it goes from source to destination and all the switching delays as you go from source to destination. All of that is what makes up the delay, the total end-to-end -end delay in uh, going from source to destination. And finally, when it gets, comes over here, um, you know, he's sitting on the lake uh, receiving the, uh, the packet. Um, there, again, it is decided by the receiving overhead. There's a software overhead for receiving the packet from the wire and finally delivering it to, uh, to John so that John can see the e email, right? So that's uh, the total um, uh, path that uh, that messages take, and and uh, so in in um, so so when you look at this message that you want to send, what are all the bad things that can happen to this as it traverses the wire? Well, first of all, your message I said is arbitrary in size, but I said that the um, uh, the network interface is going to say the hardware is going to say that well you know I can only take uh, you, you know. Uh, uh, messages of this particular size. It might say that 1024 uh, bits is, uh, is what I have as uh, the size of a message, which is called a frame, by the way. That's the, the unit of transfer that I can put on the, on, the, on the wire at any point of time, okay? And if that is the case and I have an arbitrary message, um, what do you have to do? Break it up. So first of all, you have to take that message and then break it up into what are called packets, right? And once you uh, break it up into packets, you send those packets uh, from here to here, and, and this is what is called scattering and gathering of packets. So you scatter the message into packets, and, and you gather these packets and, con and, and, and reconstruct the message of the destination, and finally deliver to the, uh, 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 to the destination, right? So this is what is involved. And um, so the, when, we, when we talk about the protocol stack, you would have heard this term protocol stack, right? So what is it? Uh, what uh, meaning does it convey to you when I say protocol stack? Uh, from the OS, right? So, uh, so we're starting. So, so here is your user, and and you're accessing an email program, let's say, and constructing a message, and then you hand it off to the operating system, right? And when you hand it off to the operating system, the operating system has to do a whole bunch of work, and all the work that the operating system has to do, from the time you get this message till it places the bits on the wire, all of that work is, is uh, subsumed in this protocol stack. And we're going to divide the um, you know, protocol stack into layers in a, in a bit, but there's a whole bunch of work that needs to be done. And let's understand all the things that may need to be done. So first of all, you, you, you saw that this message is arbitrary in size, and, and I have to break it up into packets, right? So that is one piece of work that it has to do, okay? because of the arbitrary size message. And, what, and, and once I do this, and I place the bits on the wire, it is coming to the destination. Uh, seems pretty straightforward. So there's not any more work to be done by the operating system, is there? Anything else that, that may, that what can go wrong when the, when the bits are going from source to destination first? Data loss. Why is the data, what, what, what may be the source of the data loss? Pardon me? Okay, so there could be random noise. Uh, and, and, and bits can flip, right? So, and that kind of uh, uh, a data loss is what is called data corruption, right? So data gets corrupted en route to the destination. And, uh, and it might happen to this packet, may not happen to this packet, and so on, right? So we are sending packets at a time. So each packet may potentially get corrupted, right? And, um, and that is one kind of 
data loss that can happen. Anything else that can happen? Routing to the wrong destination. So, well, uh, so the routing to the wrong destination uh, assumes that your tables are all, you know, all the tables that you have internally are all incorrect and therefore uh, something like that happens. And even if that happens, you can recover from that somehow because if it gets routed to the wrong destination, eventually you might find that that is not the right destination and then, and then the uh, switches there may reroute it, okay. That is, but that is one possibility. Um, uh, uh, Joe. Lose a packet. Why would I lose a packet? Doesn't want. So you know, Peter mentioned queuing delays, right? So you know, queuing delays is basically software delays that happen because of the fact that packets are accumulating, and and if the server decides that well, you know, there's too many packets, and I don't have queuing space for more than 100 packets, and and so it's going to just drop the packet, right? That can happen. So. This is not uh, the kind of loss that Chris was pointing out, which is, uh, you know, corruption of data packets due to random things that can happen on the wire uh, and so on, right? So, as, but this is actually intentionally you're dropping a packet, right? Um, uh, and ISP decides that, oh, I don't like Joe. Any message from Joe, I'm going to drop it, right? So, so pa packets can get dropped, and, and, and that is another source of uh, um, a problem that comes about. And this is, these are all the problems that, you know, which were not there when we, t when we said, you know, a processor memory interaction. When a processor sends a message to the memory, will memory drop a packet? <laughs> Better not, right? So that is in, the, in your control. But can bits get corrupted inside the, bo inside the box? They can get corrupted. Exactly the same way we're talking about packet corruption that Chris is saying on the network. Even inside a box, you can get packet corruption because, you know, semi semi semiconductor memories um, you know, uh, may get uh, hit with uh, alpha particles and so on, and that can flip a bit. And so, what you get back from the memory can be incorrect with respect to what you actually stored. But there are ways of co uh, uh, correcting those things. You know, uh, we haven't talked about that uh, when we talked about memory systems. But you know, there, there are things called error correction bits that you can add to the memory so that if there is a, you know, you all heard of parity. What is parity, Charles? Right, so, so a very simple way of doing error checking is because ultimately any number that you want to store, um, you're storing it as a bit pattern, right? And, and so you can count, count the number of uh, um, uh, uh, ones in that, in that and, and say that, oh, there are 10 ones in this, uh, in this particular bit pattern, and, and I'm going to keep odd parity, and so I'm going to add an extra bit that says the parity bit, and I'll say that parity bit will be, will make sure that the total number of bits um, that I have in a particular word, um, the, the ones in, the to in, 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 the, in that word is always odd. And, and so when I get back something from the memory and, and if I find that the bits that I got, they're only uh, uh, an even number of ones, then I know that there was some bit corruption that happened, right? So this is a way by which you can actually do very simple error correction within uh, a computer system. That is based on parity, but there are more sophisticated ways that parity actually detects one bit error, but it doesn't, and 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 and, and it can correct. Uh, but if there are more than one bits of error, then it doesn't uh, uh, do you any good, right? So there's more sophisticated ways of building error correction codes uh, for memory systems, and that is usually done in in all of the memory systems that you have. And the similar kind of thing that need to be that uh, needs to be done in terms of how you overcome um, uh, packet corruption in uh, uh, in the network, Jen. So um, no, it's not the same as checksum. Uh, so in in the case of um, uh, in the case of the memory system, we said that what we can do is you can simply count the number of um, uh, uh, number of bits. I mean, if you do a parity, if, if I want to use uh, uh, a parity as a mechanism for correcting errors, uh, one way to do that is to count the number of ones in that, and then use a, either use odd parity or even parity and and store a parity bit in the memory. And then when I re-access re, um, that same memory location, I can check whether that parity is preserved. If it is not, then I know it's an error, right? And that's good for uh, a computer system in which the, uh, uh, the bits are not traveling very far distances, right? It is, it is typically traveling a very short distance within the motherboard, right? And uh, so those short distances, you can tolerate this kind of error. But when you're going across the network, first of all, it's not anymore a one word that you're sending from processor to memory, right? I said that already that um, 
the size of uh, individual uh, frames that you send on the wire is decided by your network interface card, but it is not going to be as small as one uh, word, right? It's going to be bigger than that on the order of thousands of bits, right? And, and uh, so when you have that many bits, what you want to do is do something similar that we did with parity. You don't want to just do a parity, right? Because so many bits are there, right? So what you do is you count the number of bits and add a check sum that says how many, uh, 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 you know, it, you can do that checksum in, sev in several different ways. So you can actually, uh, if, I, if I have, let's say, 128 bytes in the message, then what I can do is I can take each one of those bytes, add them up, just keep adding them up. And then one, once I finish uh, the entire 128 bytes, I write another byte that says this is the total of uh, uh, the values that, I, that I'm sending in this message. That's what is called a checksum. And so the receiving end, I can do the reverse process. I can take these bytes as they come in, add them up, and, and I get a checksum. And I check whether that is the same as uh, what was sent from the, from the source. If they don't match, then there was a packet corruption. Okay? And that's way, the way by which you can actually address the problem that Chris mentioned. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Any questions on this? Yeah, Shane? It's, it can be both. Uh, you can delegate that function to the hardware and say that you know you you do the uh, checksum calculation and and append, uh, uh, but m you know m hardware may not may not do it, um, and and uh, many hardware may not you know be, because there's work to be done in order to do that, and uh, so it is pushed up to the operating system because if you do it always in the hardware, then uh, then you you're assuming that things are always are going to go wrong, right? That's the assumption that you're making when you're doing checksum and so on. Now, it is possible that if uh, Shashank and Ran are communicating in a short distance, maybe no, there will be no pack packet corruption, right? In that case, why bother doing all of that work, which is actually adding to the latency? So you can actually make that a software function, and the operating system can choose to do it or not choose to do it, depending on. So you can think of this as the protocol stack. Uh, you know, when we say the protocol stack, Shane asked a very relevant question. Uh, there is work to be done going from a message to actual bits on the wire. Now, what part of the work gets done in software, what gets done in hardware is not fixed. You can move the boundary up and down, right? But there are certain things that are going to be done in software, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And, and there are certain things that can be delegated to the, to the hardware. Yeah. yeah, so we'll talk about that. So, so, when, we, when, we, so uh, when we send packets, some of those packets can get lost. And we'll talk about how to how to recover from that. So these are the sources of uh, you know pain, the pain points in in in, uh, in network communication, right? That uh, packets uh, uh, are lost, and um, and 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 actually you know uh, uh, Shashank, you you mentioned something else, right? So uh, I want you to send this. Uh, I'm, I'm sending a message, right? Three packets, uh, and I'm going to send this message, and and you have to send it. I'm going to send it to Chris over there, okay? And, and but you you're not you're not going to send it all the way. You don't have the the the, uh, the arm strength to do that. <laughs> so you're going to go through. So here 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 another one is coming. So you and and now so you don't have to go the same way. So you can go any way you want. So go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we 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 are terrible routers here. I mean. Packets are getting misrouted. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Did any packet reach Chris yet? So I sent three packets. I started with a green packet. What did you get first? Red packet. And did you get uh, the blue packet? Where's the blue packet? OK. So it has to reach. It's not for you. You're a relay. You're a relay. <laughs> okay, so so the so my message I broke it up into three packets, right? I had a green packet first, a red packet, and then a blue packet. But I think Chris got the red packet first, right? Now this is not something we talked about. Actually, you sort of mentioned that that it can get misrouted, right? It can go to the wrong destination. It's not usually wrong destination. It is just that you know at any point of time on an internet, what happens is you have an address. The address that you have 
is Chris. That's you know, but but what you what you have is uh, the destination address, but you don't know the path to the Chris. You don't know the path. All that you know is the network that you talk to. Just like the picture that I showed you, right? From the access network, I know how to get to the ISP, the next ISP. I don't know all the way to Oregon, right? And what you did was, well, you gave it to Olga. That's the uh, uh, the only destination that you knew about. And so that is what is called the next hop. Given a destination address, you knew the next hop. I gave it to Olga, and and uh, and Olga then. Uh, gave it to Dong and it sat forever. <laughs> and but it, th this is this is something that can happen. That finally, you know, we talked about uh, packet corruption. Uh, hope, hopefully, packet didn't get corrupted, <laughs> right? Um, and and packets were not lost, but they were misrouted, right? Packet didn't. Uh, we, well, actually, we sort of lost it for a while till we woke up uh, uh, Dong and asked him to pass it on, right? So packet loss happened. And the last thing, the most important thing is. Uh, what is the thing that happened to you, Chris, uh, when you got the message? Out of order. Packets arrived out of order. So if you look at this picture here, you know, um, uh, if for this guy to reconstruct the message, it needs these packets. It has to be in order, right? That's how we can reconstruct the, the message. And but when packets get out of order, then you are in trouble now, right? Um, and and uh, so that is another thing that can happen on the network that you know that packets can get out of order. And so all of those things. Are things that the protocol stack has to handle. Everybody with me here? Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, how to deal with these uh, problems. Um, uh, so all of these things we talked about already. And so the Internet Protocol stack, uh, the protocol stack that I showed you, consists of these five layers. Okay. The application layer is the one that usually sits above the operating system, and that's the uh, uh, the programs that you're using, for instance, a web browser, or a, or a, uh, 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 or, or an email program, um, uh, so all of those are examples of um, the application layer, right? And and this is where you're generating messages that may be arbitrary in size, and and then you get, give it to the operating system. This is where the boundary is, and you give it to the operating system. This is the rest of the protocol stack, and there's a transport layer, and the transport layer uh, is the one that decides how to send a packet, you know, how to take a message and break it up into packets. It's making that decision, okay? Uh, so we'll, we'll take a break right after I finish this slide. So it, it, it makes a decision on how to break a message into packets, okay? And um, once it decides, uh, and, and, and remember that, you know, the, um, uh, uh, is the destination different for each packet? It's exactly the same, right? Because you take a message, and you broke it up into packets, and each packet is going to the same destination. So what you're going to do is you're going to affix to the uh, packet a header. Okay, there is a there is a payload, and there is a header, and the payload is the actual bits of the packet that uh, that I generated from the uh, from the application, and the header is the one that is saying where it is going. Okay, and it is also going to have other information for dealing with all the different kinds of errors that we talked about, but we'll come to that in a minute. So minimally, it is going to have um, uh, the, um, uh, the destination address. Every packet is going to have that, right? And then it is going to hand it off to the network layer. And, and the primary function of the network layer, what is it? Joe, I'll take your question if you answer that. What is the primary function of the network layer? Throughout the packet, right? So what I've got is the destination address. And, and, and I said that, you know, uh, 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 Shashank doesn't know how to get it to the, de the final uh, uh, destination, but he knows the next hop, right? Network layer is something that, that says, given an address, I know who to, who to give it to next, okay? And that's the, the role of the network layer. The primary function of the network layer is to say that given uh, 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 an end address, um, an internet address, I know how to get it, who, who to give it to as the next hop, okay? That's the role of the network layer. Now, Joe, your question. No, but the problem is that the, the hardware is not capable of taking it. So the hardware asks you to break it up anyhow, right? There's no way you can send, give it the whole message. So you have to break it up, okay? There's no cho choice here. Okay, so that's the role of the network layer. So it is actually giving it to the, uh, 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 um, uh, to the, um, uh, you know, the, it, it is actually taking it and taking a packet and then wants to give it to uh, the next hop, okay? 
but in, in order to do that, you know, I said that it is going to give it to the next hop, but that's where uh, uh, the real hardware comes in, right? You know, depending on whether you're having a wireless interface or a wired interface, and, and the, the speed of the wired interface or the wireless interface, or you may be using Bluetooth, you know, can use a variety of networks in order to communicate uh, what you have as a packet uh, uh, on the wire. And the wire is sort of logical, right? Wire may be just ether. It may not be a physical wire, but it's, it, is, uh, it is ether, or it could be um, a photonic switching. So any of those things is what I call as a wire in, in a virtual sense, right? But in order to do that, it really needs to know the properties of the wire, and that's where the link layer comes in. The link layer is saying that, you know, the, uh, the, net, the, the next hub that you want to go to, or uh, the link to Olga, is actually um, a, a wireless link, okay? And, 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 and the packet size that you have is this big. And, and so even though network, you know, the, the, uh, the transport layer doesn't know finally what is the physical link on which some uh, packet is going to traverse. All it knows, so, so you're, you're tr sort of uh, uh, dividing up the, the functionality. We talked about abstractions all the time, right? Throughout the semester, we've been talking about abstractions. One of the powers of abstraction is you don't have to worry about the rest of it. You can treat the rest of it as a black box. Okay, so from the point of view of the transport, if I have to know all the way down to the wire, right, so you said that why not send the whole thing. If I have to send it, you know, then I have to know too much details, right, and I have to make all the decisions in the transport layer in terms of whether this packet is going to go out on, a, on an Ethernet card or, you know, a wireless card or a Bluetooth and so on and so forth. So in order to shield that uh, functionality, the transport level functionality, what we say is, you know, network is going to give you an interface that says break it up into packets of this size, okay. Regardless of how it is finally going to send it, it is saying just break it up into packets of this size. And so the transport layer can use that abstraction and say, well, given a message, I'll break it up into packets that are of a particular size. That is the interface that is provided by the network layer. The network layer then says, well, I have to take this packet and, you know, let's say that the network gave an interface that says uh, every packet can be you know, um, uh, 1024 bytes. Okay. But it finds that it has to send it out on a Bluetooth connection and, and that might take only 64 bytes at a time. That's what is the, the hardware limitation of the physical um, interconnect. That's where the link layer comes in that says, this is the frame. So link layer, uh, what we talk about is what is called a frame. So you can think of a packet, which is an entity that the transport layer converts the message into. Network layer then gives it to the link layer in frames, so given um, uh, packet consists of a whole bunch of frames, and 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 now there is no reordering, right? Because going from uh, uh, from uh, Shashank to Olga, the bits are going to go uh, uh, in order, so we don't have to worry about bits getting uh, uh, the, you know, the frames getting misordered or anything like that. So he's going to send all the frames of the packet to Olga, and that is it, right? And, and so they come in order, so no problem with that. And the only thing is network has to size uh, the original packet into these frames and send it out on the wire. Everybody with me here? Any questions on this? So now the, the next part is the link layer is doing the physical signaling. That's where the electrical properties of the actual network comes in, right? So far we've been dealing with bits. Now if the frame consists of 64 bytes, then you know those 64 bytes had to be pushed out on the physical wire, and the physical wire may be photonic switching, could be wireless, uh, it could be um, a wired Ethernet, and so on and so forth. So these are all the things that come into play. And going back to uh, Shane's original question, usually the line is right here. So this is the uh, up to here is the um, uh, is the operating system functionality, and usually the link layer and the physical layer is part of the uh, uh, the hardware. Okay. So let's take a short break, and when we come back, we'll do uh, uh, PRS, and then and then we'll continue with transport protocol. So the. Uh, oh, why is this? Let's see. Why is this not showing up above this? So this is uh, 
um, you know, on your uh, parallel systems and a uh, little bit of I O. Shane, we have started the PRS. Yeah. Right. So, uh, I see uh, there the are two, two answers that are close uh, right here. So, uh, let us let's talk about this. So, when you have user level threads, but the operating system only does process level scheduling, what that means is that the operating system uh, does not know the existence of threads in your process, right. So, it is scheduling a process and could, you can have multiple threads and uh, um, so, Obviously, it's not one. It serves no purpose since the operating system does. So, it's not, but but you know, is is it useful as for overlapping computation as I/O? Is it is it useful for that? It it seems like it might be useful, but unfortunately, let's say that you know, if you have multiple threads, one of them does an I/O. What's going to happen? It's a blocking I/O. What's going to happen? Pardon me. That thread has to wait. What about the process itself? The whole thing has to wait, right? So it doesn't really help in overlapping I/O with computation, because even if you have multiple threads, and all the other threads can do useful work, one of them does a blocking I/O, and that that's the one that was running right now. It made a blocking I/O. Your host, right? The process is going to be uh, um, blocked by the operating system because the process doesn't know the existence of threads within within that process. Is that idea clear? Right, so two is not a good answer. Right, two is not a good answer, but it is useful as a structuring mechanism at the user level because that's a way by which you can think of how to partition. Just like you have procedures to break up a program into uh, into modules, you know you can use thread as a structuring mechanism. This is a functionality that one thread is going to perform. This is a functionality that is another thread is going to perform. That's a way you can organize your uh, uh, your computation. It does not help you uh, in, in terms of performance because the operating system does not know about the existence of threads, but it is helpful as a structuring mechanism. Is that idea clear? Okay. So, 3 is the right answer. Okay. So, another question on user level threads. Uh, so, it is user level threads again does the processor operating system know about these threads? It does not right and if it does not know about the threads then how can the hard, you know, how can you take advantage of the concurrency that is there in the hardware right. So, one, one would not apply right because it is not something that the user level threads uh, can take advantage of and uh, of course, it is possible to implement anything. So. Uh, so, second is not true. Uh, what about the third one? For the same reason that I said that you cannot take advantage, it has no performance advantage on a multiprocessor compared to a uniprocessor, right? Because if you have user level threads, 
it is a structuring mechanism, but the operating system does not know about it and therefore, it is not going to help you in, in getting any performance for that, right. So, the right answer is C. Is that idea clear? Charles, you have a question? You have a question? Or no. So, 3 is the, is the right answer. Quite a few of you chose 1, but that is not right unfortunately, right. Unless the operating system knows about threads, you cannot take advantage of the hardware concurrency, right. Everybody with me here on this? Okay. And you know, and not too many people chose uh, three, so I'm worried. <laughs> and and seven is invalid. <laughs> okay. Pardon me. Yeah, quite a, quite a few got it wrong. So make sure that you understand these concepts because I'm going to test you on the final exam. Uh, so, this is something that I am hoping that you will know right away. We talked about caches. All right, so that's good. So most of you have the right answer because you've got you've got shared memory, and and since the uh, the uh, page table is in shared memory, then you know all the threads are going to see exactly um, uh, the same page table, right? And so uh, number two is the right answer. Everybody with me here on this? Okay. So two is the right answer, and some of you have picked. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to replicate the page table because it's for a single process with one page table and it is in shared memory, so all the threads can see it. Okay, so let us do one more and Please do not pick 5. All right, so most of the right answer is, so in the case of a TLB, we talked about it. We said that, you know, data is, uh, you know, data is kept consistent, consistent usually in an SMP by the hardware doing cache coherency, but the TLB is something that is in t inside the processor and, and that is the responsibility of the operating system. So every time it changes the page table entry, it has to make sure that all the other TLBs are, um, uh, are kept consistent either by invalidating or updating it and so it is the responsibility of the operating system. So three is the right choice, okay. So that is good for today and now we will go back to. So we, we understand the functionality of uh, the internet protocol stack um, and, and uh, we, we saw uh, in particular what the um, uh, uh, each of these layers are doing. So what we are going to do is now we are going to start talking about, um, uh, we are talking about uh, the, uh, uh, <coughs> the transport layer and this is a picture that we have seen before that you know in, in, if you look at what is going on in the internet. Uh, at the source, you have all the five layers, right? All the five layers are here uh, because you have an application running on your on your PC or desktop or PDA or whatever, and you have uh, you need the transport, the network, and the link layer to get the packets out. Okay. But as we talked about how packets get routed through the network, we said that you know there are intermediate points. If you if you look at how the messages uh, went went to Olga and Olga passed it on to Dong and so on and so forth, right? So, does Olga need all the five layers? 
she doesn't, right? Because you know it, she's just a, 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 a packet relay, right? All that functionality that um, uh, Olga uh, had to do was, uh, you know, given the destination, she had to figure out what is the next stop. Just like what network layer at Shashank did, Olga had to make the determination. And therefore, all that you need at this level is the network layer and down, right? You don't need the uh, transport layer or you don't need the um, uh, the application layer, right? Is that idea clear? So all the intermediate nodes in the network, as you go from source to destination, the switches, they're all network switches, meaning the protocol stack that uh, that exists on those switches uh, is, is network layer, link layer, and the physical layer, okay? And it can go through any number of these switches and finally it gets to the destination. And at the destination, you need the full protocol stack because you have to reassemble the packet into a message and deliver it to the application, right? So this is how um, uh, all these um, uh, layers come together. So now we're going to look at uh, transport layer and the functionality that is in the transport layer. And we'll look at three different uh, varieties of uh, uh, transport layer. Um, so, so let's do this uh, experiment again. This time, my switch is uh, run, okay? Now, what you're going to do is you're going to send your message to, this time, uh, to Emily over there, okay? Uh, and so that's, that's you know. That's a that's a laborious router there. It actually gets up and all right. Now, so you notice what happened here. So you know, for this message, uh, I was waiting for every one of those. I mean, I, I don't know whether the, the message actually reached. Do I know where the message reached? I don't know where the message reached. I I, I don't see. <laughs> I I am nearsighted. I cannot see past Ron. <laughs> So, you know, I don't know where the message reached, right? And uh, now one way, and, and the other thing that you notice is that I was also, uh, you know, um, uh, that is one part of the problem, right? That, that, that I don't know, how, how can I make sure that the message actually reached? Confirmation. So, you know, if, if you think about, again, the postal system, usually you send them a letter, and you don't know whether the, 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 uh, uh, the intended recipient got it or not, right? But if you do want it, there's a way of doing that. What is the thing in postal service that allows you to do that? Well, tracking and, you know, postal service has something called delivery confirmation. So you can actually make sure that the, the Emily signs something and sends it back. And therefore, I'll know that I got the, uh, you know, I, I, my, my message is actually delivered, right? And that in the internet uh, terminology is called an acknowledgement, right? So you, you can uh, send an act packet. So when I send a packet, I can have Emily send back an acknowledgement, okay? And, uh, and, and what I might do is, you know, I might say, look, you know, uh, I, want, I don't want to send all the packets. I had three packets, right, for the message. And um, so uh, what I did, you can assume that for every packet, she sent me an acknowledgement. And only when I got the acknowledgement, I'm going to send it. So, you know, Sherd said that, uh, you know, I can visually see. And that's what I did. So I had a visual acknowledgement that, you know, my packet actually reached Emily, and when I saw that she got the packet, I gave the next packet to, uh, 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 to Ron so that he can then send it on, right? So we're doing one packet at a time till it reaches the destination, and I get an, an, an acknowledgement for that packet from the destination, right? And that is what is called stop and wait, okay? Basically, I'm stopping transmission, right? Transport, I'm the transport layer. I'm not uh, transmitting the next packet until I get an acknowledgement that the packet has reached the destination. Is that idea clear? Pardon me? I did that. So I waited. I waited till Emily got that message. I, I got the packet. And, and once I got the visual acknowledgement, I then sent the next packet to, uh, to Ron so that he can then route it, right? And, uh, and here, uh, can there be packet loss? I mean, can there be packet arriving out of order? 
there is no problem with that, right? So uh, there could be packet corruption. That can happen, right? Packet corruption can happen. And, and if a packet corruption happens, how will I know that? It's no acknowledgement. So, you know, if uh, Emily shook her head <laughs> saying that, oh, no, no, this packet is awful, then I know that she didn't get it, right? In, in that case, what am I going to do? I'm going to resend that packet, right? So I'm going to retransmit that packet. So the transport layer functionality in stop and wait is to make sure that I get, a, get an acknowledgement for a packet that I send. And once I get, an, a, and, uh, and that acknowledgement is a positive acknowledgement, right? And, or it could be a negative acknowledgement um, that, that says that the packet was corrupted. So that is one uh, way of knowing that, right? Uh, or I can get no acknowledgement. When can that happen? You know, when w one packet was dropped over there, right? It can get lost. It can still get lost. If it gets lost, then how will I know? I don't receive anything. No, I cannot send the next packet because the stop and wait protocol says that I'm going to send one packet until I know that Emily has received the packet. I'm not going to send the next one, right? And I can get either positive acknowledgement, right? She actually nods her head and says that, yes, I got the packet. Or negative acknowledgement, she says, oh, no, this packet is corrupted. In that case, I'm going to retransmit that same packet, right? But the third is a, is a sticky situation where the packet was lost, right? In that case, what am I going to do? Uh, EG? Right, so what, what Eugene is saying is the third situation is, wa is one in which I have no acknowledgement, positive or negative, right? And therefore, then what I have to do is I have to time out, right? I wait for a certain amount of time. I know that, you know, a uh, packet to Emily is not going to take more than a millisecond, right? And, and uh, an acknowledgement back from her is going to take another millisecond, let's say. In two milliseconds, I want to have uh, uh, seen the um, acknowledgement, right? So if in two milliseconds I don't see an acknowledgement, I can assume that the packet was dropped somewhere, right? And it could be that my packet was dropped or maybe it is Emily's acknowledgement, right? Both those can happen because all of those are subject to the same vagaries of the network, right? So either my packet didn't get through or her acknowledgement did not come through. In either case, I have to wait for a certain amount of time and then retransmit, right? So one of the, so the, the functionalities in the, in the stop and wait protocol is, of course, to break a message into packets. And once you break it into packets, then uh, send the packet and wait for an acknowledgement. And, and uh, retransmit the packet if it was corrupted or retransmit the packet if it was lost. And the way you know it was lost is because of the timeout, right? And, uh, and you know, I could say that, well, it takes about a millisecond, and therefore I can use that as a vehicle for deciding the, um, uh, the timeout parameter. Uh, but usually that's not done. Usually what you do is you, you use a round trip, saying that, you know, um, I'm going to think about what is a round trip delay going from me to Emily and back. And why would I want to do that? Why would I want to use round trip as opposed to one way delay? Any idea, Joe? No, no, I could simply double it, right? Yeah. yeah. Ah, there you go. So the point is that, you know, if I use one way delay and double it, that, that's one way of computing the timeout. But the, but the assumption there is that, the, uh, the, uh, the path that's going to be traversed is the same, right? We know it is not the same. It can go through different paths to, uh, to Emily, and therefore the acknowledgement com can come from a different path. And therefore, re we really want to use round trip delay. And, and, and so you use the round trip uh, uh, time as a parameter to decide how big is the uh, time mode that you want to get. Is that idea clear? That's what a stop and wait protocol, okay? Um, Michael. Sure, yeah, so what Michael is saying is, well, I, I timed out and, and uh, Emily sent through uh, Tim and he went off to sleep. And eventually he woke up <laughs> and, and, uh, and, 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 you know, he sent the acknowledgement to me. And in the meanwhile, I timed out and I sent the uh, message again, right? What, what's going to happen now? Pardon me? Well, now there's a problem, right? I have three packets to start with. And now I, se I sent four packets, right? Because I, I waited for a timeout and then sent, resent the message. 
and, and she did get the message, the, the packet the first time around. And she, she's going to get the green packet again because I, I thought that she didn't get it. And, and now she's got duplicates of the green packet. And, uh, and she might think that now the message contains four packets when, it, when in fact it is only three packets. How do you, how do you detect that? How, what, do you, what, do you, what, what, what do we need in the header file? Number of the, so what that number is what is called a sequence number. So uh, to solve Michael's problem, what you need is a sequence number for the packet. So I said that we'll break it up into three packets. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to associate a packet number for each one of these. I'm going to say there's packet one, packet two, packet three. So even if Emily gets uh, the green packet again, she'll look at the packet number and say, oh, the sequence number. And she says, oh, this sequence number I've seen before. So this must be a duplicate. And she doesn't even, and she'll acknowledge that packet again to make sure that I don't resend it, right? Uh, because she might think that the acknowledgement got dropped. And it may have been dropped, or it may be that it is slow in coming to me. But in either case, uh, by sending the acknowledgement again, I know that she did get it the first time itself, and I won't retransmit it. So in other words, even if I end up sending more packets than what I intended to, the sequence number is a mechanism by which uh, the destination can know that the original message contains only three packets and she can put it together. Mm -hmm. so pack, you think of it as a simple pack, uh, sequence number is just a monotonically increasing number. Okay? Think of it as a monotonically increasing number. Okay? So I take a message and I have to break it up into 1,000, 100 packets. I just give uh, each one of those packets a unique number, one, two, three, and and so on, right? And 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 uh, and that's the sequence number. Is that idea clear? We'll come to that. That's the next thing. Pipeline pro protocol. We'll get to that. So, uh, but first, I want to make sure that you understand the stop and wait protocol. Very simple protocol, right? Because the amount of you know, the the short answer to your question is. Um, it's it's uh, easier to build a stop and wait protocol, right, than any of the more complicated ones that we're going to talk about in a minute. But the stop and wait protocol, all that you're doing is breaking into packets, sending one packet at a time, and then getting an acknowledgement. Okay, um, Jin, you had a question. Yeah, right. So so let's say so what Jin is asking is what if I miscalculated the round trip time? So what I'm going to do is. I, I, let's say I, I thought it was going to take two milliseconds, right? And um, and uh, uh, so I timed out and and sent the packet again because I, within two milliseconds I didn't get a, a response back. So happens that it is really a busy day, and uh, and and packets are getting a long uh, time to get to the destination. So in fact, it takes four milliseconds in reality, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to notice that, right? I'm going to notice that I'm retransmitting a lot. And in fact, the packets are getting through, but it's just that I'm retransmitting a lot. Then I readjust the timeout parameter. So you don't want to, you set it as something, it's a guesstimate, but you might retune it depending on what you see. Okay? Jane? Yeah. You could do that. So, you know, that's another thing that you might do in order to do buffer allocation of the destination because the destination needs to know how big the, um, uh, uh, the message is going to be. And so you might, you might include the number of packets or the total size of the message or any of those kinds of things as part of it to, to make sure that you, you know. Um, Joe. No, no. So again, the sequence number oh. that we send it, she's going to acknowledge using the sequence number. So I, I'm going to see the sequence number of the acknowledgement and know that Emily got the first packet, Emily got the second packet, and so on. And and uh, and in the stop and wait protocol, the packets are going in order, right? So she'll she's always going to acknowledge uh, uh, using the sequence number. Now, I'll ask you a question. 
I said sequence number and I said that you know, take a message and let's break it up into 100 packets and I'm going to associate uh, a unique number to each one of these. And so you know the, um, the, 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 the size of the sequence number, the field of, se of the sequence number is as big as the number of packets I might have in a, in a message. So for instance, if I have um, a message with 1,000 packets, then I need a sequence number that is at least 1,000, right? Um, and, and so that, that many bits I need in order to, uh, in the header, to indicate uniquely a particular packet. But do I really need that big a sequence number given that it is a stop and wait protocol? Think about it. How would I do that? So since I'm doing one uh, packet at a time, okay, what I can do is I can associate a one bit as a sequence number, right? A zero or one. So I, I, uh, even though I have hundred packets, I'm going to just say that this is a zero packet. Goes to Emily. Emily is going to acknowledge saying that I got packet zero. Then I'm going to set uh, the next packet. I'm going to associate one with it, right? It still s satisfies the contract, right? So. You can see that the sequence number field need not be as big as the size of the message, but all you need is one bit. And that is another advantage of the stop and wait protocol that it is very, very simple in terms of uh, how you do the acknowledgement. And it, for this reason, stop and wait protocol is also called alternating bit protocol because you're alternating the sequence number on every, on every packet. Everybody with me so far? inefficiency. All that is, all that it is called, and there is no correctness problem in the stop and wait protocol, right? Because the way we set it up, we will make sure that we either get positive acknowledgement or negative acknowledgement or no acknowledgement. And we know how to deal with all three ca cases. So there is no correctness issue, okay? The only thing that can happen is performance issue that, you know, I might end up uh, not using the network very effectively. Ron? Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, so that's the, the idea behind, you know, so if I'm sending a here message from here to Bangalore, right, so I'm basically uh, sending one packet and, 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 and the once, once I send the packet, I'm going to wait till an acknowledgement comes in and I'm going to send the packet next and so on, right? And so it is going to be very, very inefficient in the use of uh, the network, right? Suppose I have a gigabit network here going from here to here and, and if I'm saying that, you know, I have to wait for a round trip before I can send the next packet. Um, and uh, uh, let's say that, you know, um, uh, um, I'm, I'm the round trip delay is 2 milliseconds. Then if it's 2 milliseconds, we are talking about 500 packets uh, per second that you can actually send. And, and if you do the math, uh, let's say the packet is about 1,000 bits, um, then it will come to about 4 megabits per second is what I'm actually uh, getting in terms of the throughput. But if I have a gigabit link and I'm using only four, four megabits per second, that's a pretty inefficient use, right? So suppose I have a gigahertz processor and, and I'm using it only 1% of the time, you'll not be very happy, right? That's the same thing. It's less than a percent uh, in terms of its usage. So stop and wait protocol um, is very simple, but it is very inefficient in terms of performance. So what we want to do is ideally, as, as uh, uh, um, uh, Eugene pointed out, I want to do this. I want to basically, um, we've talked about all this so you can get, you can get to this. So I want to basically say that if I want to send a message, I just want to blast all the packets, right? That's what Eugene wants to do, right? So he just wants to blast all these packets and, and uh, you know, it should get to the destination and we are happy, right? And, and this will make sure that we use all the um, bandwidth that's available uh, between the source and the destination effectively. Now, what is the problem with this? All the problems that we talked about, right, that the packets can get lost and, you know, and so on and so forth, you have to address all of those things, which means you need acknowledgements, okay? And, 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 uh, and so this is what is called a pipeline protocol. And uh, now pipeline protocol, one of the, one of the uh, real bad things about uh, the stop and wait protocol is there is an assumption that packets will be lost, right? That's an assumption that is there in every packet that I send, I'm thinking negatively that, oh, it's going to get lost. <laughs> I'm waiting for an acknowledgement before I do the, anything with it, right? So this is a very optimistic situation where you're saying, I'm just going to send it. I know it's going to get there, right? So it's a very optimistic protocol. 
And, um, and this may be okay if, uh, if, if, if uh, the higher level entity like your um, um, uh, uh, application program can deal with the fact that the whole message may be lost, right? But if the transport wants to give you a guarantee that the message is going to get delivered, and, and just like the postal service, the postal service does this, right? <laughs> so you just send all the things and you hope that it gets there. Um, and, and, but if you want an acknowledgement that it actually got there, uh, then the, uh, the, the protocol has to do more than this. So we'll, we'll look at pipeline protocol with um, acknowledgements. Um, and I don't think uh, I have time to do that, so we'll do that on Thursday. On? Th today is Thursday. Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay.